All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, hello and welcome to our ATARC webinar series. And uh, we've got a great topic today. We're talking about securing modern uh, application applications with DevSecOps. I am Tom Suter. I am the founder and CEO of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And I'm really, uh, I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel. And uh, for those of the, you that don't know, ATARC stands for the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. Most call us ATARC, that's kind of, kind of a mouthful there, but we facilitate collaboration between government, industry, and academia on these tough issues that the federal government faces on a day-to-day -day basis in IT, such as DevSecOps. So I'd like to welcome all the attendees. A lot of people are logging in right now. Uh, special thanks to uh, Lau Marsh, uh, Sarah Lopaden, uh, Tara, Terry Beck, and everyone else on the F5 team. We couldn't put this together without them. And so today, what we're going to hear is we're going to hear from our panelists first. We're going to follow that with a Q&A session. And I'm going to pop in a few poll questions. And uh, we're going to get you, we're going to actually go to the audience and hear some, some of your great questions that are going to come in. Uh, just so you know, just uh, be sure to answer the poll question. It's part of us giving out CPEs as we have this interaction with the, with the crowd. And, uh, you know, these polls are very important. It kind of helps us understand you know, what the audience, uh, what state of maturity that their audience is at uh, as far as our government colleagues and the folks that work with the government. So if I can bring all the panelists on, I'm going to do a quick introduction and then we're going to dive into the discussion a little bit. So if we can get Ian, Matthew, Shane, Hannah, and Chris, there we go. I think we got a full house. Um, uh, First, we have Ian Anderson, who's lead DevSecOps engineer, secure cloud architecture and automation at the US Navy, a little away from Ian. Uh, we've got Matthew Houston, uh, Chief Information Security Officer at Platform One, Office of the Chief Software Officer, United States Department of Air Force. Uh, welcome, Matthew. We also have with us Shane Barney, Chief Information Security Officer, US Citizenship and Immigration Services at the United States Department of Homeland Security. Welcome, Shane. And uh, Hannah Hunt, Chief Product and Innovation Officer, U.S. Army fact, uh, Software Factory at the U.S. Army's Future Command at the United States Department of Army, which is now my, one of my favorite services since my son is a second lieutenant in the Army. Um, good stuff. And we also, last but certainly not least, we have Chris Witek, who's our industry expert. He's a Senior Director of Product Management at F5. Hello, Chris. So why don't we just... Uh, We'll start off with Ian. Um, Ian, uh, I'd love to hear kind of where where you guys finished up last year and what you're looking to do in, in this next year and, and some of the trends that you've seen. Uh, yes, definitely. So uh, I currently work with the Naval Surface Warfare Center Dahlgren uh, at their Damnac activity. Um, so uh, this past year uh, was working on the effort to really take a look at, uh, you know, the viability of, you know, bringing a software factory or utilizing, you know, one of the software factories uh, for our projects at Dahlgren. Um, you know, wh what we took a look at was we, we are working capital fund and we have, uh, you know, our, our projects are getting money from somebody else and, you know, they execute, deliver the product. So, we have a lot of siloed communication, a lot of siloed collaboration, and you know a lot of projects at different levels. So bringing kind of that software factory concept to offer services at the enterprise level. Um, so I, I was the acting technical lead for uh, the the beginning of our uh, small software factory at uh, for NSWC Dahlgren. Uh, they've now filled that position. I've moved over to a department that is uh, offering out our cloud capabilities. And, um, you know, it's not solely just to NSWC Dahlgren, but to, uh, you know, any project or group or team out in the uh, federal government. So now working as their lead DevSecOps engineer to, you know, really br bring those uh, DevSecOps, DevOps best practices, um, you know, when it comes to scaling uh, within the cloud and, you know, uh, re really getting teams, you know, up to par if they are not. Great, thank you for that. And next, let's go over to uh, Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's been a, a wild year for the Army Software Factory. We've really only been in existence for about a year now. Um, our big focus uh, is to upskill soldiers so that they can build and deliver our software capabilities for soldiers and user, users around the force. And so yeah, we spend a significant amount of time and investment 
um, to, sorry, one second, uh, probably hearing some background noise on my end. Give me one sec. I'm going to scooch somewhere else. Hopefully not. Hey, we're in a pandemic. Things like this happen all the time. We just yeah, have yeah. to trust. Yeah. We'll just go with it. Um, but yeah, so uh, over the last year, we've been training and upskilling like soldiers in modern software the development practices. For two years, and we've been building right, software uh, for the workforce, um, a variety yeah, of functional and areas, and also building a platform as a service that those applications can rely on. Great. Thank you for that, Hannah. And I, I love how you can do that, even though there's distractions. I know, I know, I know in this business that happens. Good job. Um, next, we'll go with uh, uh, Matthew Houston. Matt, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Tom. I like uh, the yeah, look, too. That's like a security guy, you know, like you're, you know, I, it, it, it's it's good and casual. I love it. Well, absolutely. And I think that that's uh, one of the things that we have really embraced is trying to change the culture yeah. around a lot of the work that we're doing. Uh, we have recognized that, you know, you can find experts within any of the ranks. And as we've been uh, really taking this dead sec ops movement the last five years, uh, we pulled up people from, you know, just coming in being uh, basic engineers that had a tremendous talent and then put them in key leadership positions to really help further along our efforts. But with Platform One, uh, we are really trying to scale out this whole concept and continue this dead sec ops movement, not only across the Air Force, but also across uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, so I work a lot with the DOD CIO office, trying to establish different policies that we can uh, try to push out, uh, try to get the policies rewritten so that way they can support the modern development. Uh, we are always trying to iterate on our security posture, uh, always trying to make improvements, uh, looking into uh, various different uh, fields, such as, you know, your SBOM, your SCRM. Uh, personally, I'm wanting to venture down some chaos engineering uh, and do some more binary analysis type work, uh, but definitely uh, a lot of work that still needs to get done. Uh, we already got a question for you. What happened to your beard? Yeah, so uh, many of you could see in the, the picture that uh, was uh, advertised a little bit ago, I had this nice, beautiful beard that was perfectly shaped and everything. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to shave it off whenever I'm on reserve duty. Uh, so uh, January and February, I'm doing some reserve time, uh, as well as still working for Platform One. Uh, then I have to go down to regs and make sure that I'm meeting the requirements. Uh, that is that is funny. Um... Well, you got, you got, you zinged them back. So that's good. Um, you got, had a good reason for shaving your beard. Uh, Shane. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, for, you know, USCIS, we have been uh, involved in DevSecOps for over 10 years now. Um, we were early adopters of it, very early, actually, and early adopters of cloud um, to the point now where my enterprise is probably 90% based, cloud based, and, and we've really matured our DevSecOps program um, to the point where, you know, we now, are very, very good at seeing the problem from the kind of the user end perspective, you know, understanding both the outcomes and the business value in one, um, as well as more importantly, in my view, helping our end state users, you know, articulate the problem visually, you know, and that's really critical because the things that we deliver need to, to, to actually fulfill the mission, fulfill the, the goals of the organization. Um, but also we we're, we're really good at coding and we're really good at development. Um, we're a heavy, heavy agile shop. Um, which means that you know we focus on those quick wins, very short return cycles. This allows for us for quick feedback from the user community, but more importantly, it allows us to experiment, to try things, and and reduce our overall risk in doing so. Um, of course, we're constantly reviewing our architecture and constantly pushing envelopes and, and constantly trying to be tip of the spear, um, which has both its goods and its bad. So we could always have a good debate on that. Um, but in terms of you know as CISO of, of an organization that's like this, obviously. You know, the traditional sort of federal approach to security does not work and it didn't work. And, and we've learned a lot of hard lessons over the last 10 years um, that we've had to incorporate into how we all do things, how we practice and, and the, the approach that we take to security. Um, and, and now as USCIS is maturing sort of into the next evolution of what it's going to do from a both a development standpoint as well as sort of an, an enterprise level architecture standpoint, moving into microservices as well as serverless. Um, that, that in and of itself is going to drive the conversation in a whole new different direction. DevSecOps traditional DevSecOps anyway, doesn't really work very well in the microservices world. Um, it, it, there's a number of shortcomings that just don't fulfill the needs. There, there's a lot of things that have to be dealt with. 
Um, and then, of course, if you start talking serverless, well, then you, you kind of have to start throwing out a lot of things. So, you know, that's sort of where we're at today as we move into that, have moved into that, I should say, more past tense. Um, and how that, how our security posture and, and the approach security we take is going to change. Great. Yeah, I think we'll get into some of the, the new trends maybe in a little bit and get everybody else involved. But I like what you said, you know, service, you know, microservices and, and how do we, we handle that? We're trying to be like Netflix. It's kind of hard to be like Netflix, right? Um, a lot of new challenges there. And uh, Chris, um, uh, happy to have you. It's great to get this industry perspective. And I know you've got a lot of experience across different industries and across government. Uh, love to hear what you have to say about uh, what you see. Sure, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I actually represent the uh, Nginx business unit part of F5. And that's interesting in itself right now because I think a lot of our um, people familiar with DevOps will be familiar with Nginx. You know, Nginx has a tremendous footprint as an open source data plane that can be used in a variety of different use cases as part of application and deployment. You know, it can be used as a web server, API gateway, load balancer, it can be used as CDN. We see increasingly being used as an ingress controller in service mesh type situations. And then uh, Nginx is part of F5, and a lot of people are familiar with F5 for both its security offerings as well as offerings for their traditionally um, structured towards network infrastructure teams. And the part of Nginx that I'm focused on really is kind of the intersection of both those areas, right? So my teams own the security offerings within Nginx as well as the management plane offerings of Nginx. And it's really trying to marry together, um, making sure that we can provide consistent um, security offerings that can fit on top of Nginx. So it works within you know, people's uh, pipelines, um, works within their kind of their agile methodology but can have a tie back to those security teams. So the security teams can offer kind of that consistency and guidance. And, you know, and a lot of the words I heard with the, everybody's introduction kind of directly relates to a lot of things I see with customers, right? We hear talk of silos, we hear talk of friction between development and security. I think DevSecOps is, is really grown as a concept to help alleviate some of that friction, you know, building out kind of consistency in terms of your platforms, consistency in terms of your, your policies, uh, consistency in how um, I heard a consistent outcomes mentioned um, and that's really a lot of things that we're focusing on too. And we talked to a lot of our customers and I, I would say that I think across a lot of the industries focus on DevSecOps is fairly immature. Um, I'm happy to see with our panel here, a lot of maturity with there, but a lot, with a lot of our customers, oftentimes we don't see a DevSecOps person existing as a real title, but more as the one person on that development team who's nominated that knows something about security that can talk to the security guys and get them out of trouble, right? So um, I think it's an evolving concept, but one that I see a lot of momentum behind. Yeah, and that kind of goes to, uh, thank you for that, Chris. That kind of goes to my first question. You know, I remember back in the dark ages when I was involved with development, you know, you develop the whole project or a very big chunk of it and you think you're done and then you hand it over to CISA, they hit the button on HP Fortify, comes back and there's like 3,000 problems, you know, problems. How, you know, how, will Dev, how does DevSecOps change the way we develop security skills and, and what kind of metrics should we, we focus on? And uh, um, Han Hannah, if you maybe you can kick that off. I heard you through the person in your cube to the, into the brig, so we're not going to get any more interference or anything. That's true. Uh, <laughs> so we actually just got an application to production yesterday, um, which is amazing. Um, this is now our fifth application that has gone through uh, the DevSecOps playbook that we've codified here in the Army, and really the 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 process itself is that we have security advocates and evangelists whose sole job is to enable the success of the application teams to understand what security controls and stigs they need to maintain in order to go to production. So there is this very tight feedback loop with security. They pair multiple times a week, understand what things need to be built and they're developers by trade. So they know they're developers with a security mindset. So they know what needs to be built in order to be secure. So instead of so-and-so uh, sending over an Excel spreadsheet with their Fortify scan results, we have this rapid feedback loop with the security team, um, or they're called application security validation engineers, um, to ensure that teams can rapidly iterate with their users and are able to push to production so long as they meet a certain set of security guardrails as they go through their CI/CD pipeline. We try to automate this as much as possible, um, but in the Army in particular, there's not a strong skill set in application development so it's not just a teaching and enablement piece, but also ensuring that this method of software development can be evangelized. So instead of doing pushes to prod every two to three months, you know, our teams are doing it on a weekly basis. 
um, and really taking a lot of lessons learned from the Air Force and from what Matt's team has implemented there um, and ensuring that we are continuing that here in the Army. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Ian? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, what, one of the big strengths and, you know, one of the things that I think DevSecOps or DevOps is seen as uh, when, it, you know, comes from the perspective of all these different groups are trying to bring together, um, you know, especially your, your program managers is that, you know, you say, let's build in security. We want, you know, all of this feedback. We want these metrics, you know, all these great things that, you know, when, when we look at it together, we say, great, this is really going to, you know, uh, actually uh, help push the product through uh, at a more rapid pace. Uh, but, you know, your, your developers or project managers will look at and say, oh, well, but, you know, I, we may have some vulnerabilities. We, we don't want to show that right now. Or, you know, we're going to work through that uh, later on. So it's kind of, um, you know, what I've seen is that, you know, uh, as the product develops, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we'll get to that bridge when we get there. Okay, we got through that and then you have this come along. Okay, we'll get to that bridge when we get there. And my analogy for it is, you know, for DevSecOps, it's, you know, we'll get to that bridge when we get there. And that is, we're going to get to the uh, Chesapeake Bay bridge tunnel. You know, we're all going to do that up front and then we're going to cross the, the long bridge, you know, all together here. So it's, you know, not about really uh, that mindset of uh, let's go ahead and push this off uh, and, until we need to worry about it or, you know, until we need to do the Fortify scans or need to hand it to our networking folks. Let's bring everybody together and say, okay, you know, uh, where where is this going to live? You know, how, how is it going to be built? What, you know, what is needed to meet, you know, all the stigs and RMF and uh, everything. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it, you have to, uh, you know, not scare away your, uh, your uh, teams and projects. You have to say, yes, we understand that this may be a big lift for some projects, uh, you know, especially if it's a legacy project, uh, you know, uh, so, something very large, uh, you kind of have to reassure them that, you know, uh, we're, we're bringing everybody together. We're here to help. It's not a, you will do this, so go out and do it. Um, and, you know, that, that's one of our biggest things is, you know, you, you, when you go to onboard a team, especially into a software factory, it's key during that onboarding to really work with the team and, you know, kind of gauge where they're at, uh, especially when it comes to uh, a lot of these best practices and some of the tools that they want to use. So that way you're not, okay, it sounds like you have everything, go do it. And then, you know, they, they really aren't prepared to do it. Yeah. And, uh, Shane, I uh, want to hear your perspectives. And just a little background, I, I was talking about this on the prep call with Shane. Uh, his former boss, Mark Schwartz, was the one that kind of got us into DevOps here at ATARC, and, he, and they were one of the, the leaders. And he was the chair of my com first Dev DevOps conference for like two years. And I know you came, uh, you know, you've been, you guys have been, had a very mature organization. You've been doing DevOps for a while. I'd uh, yeah. love to hear your perspectives on, on this, on the security. Yeah, Mark, Mark came yeah. to CIS with the intent goal to do two things, you know, make, uh, change waterfall development to agile and deploy to the cloud. And he succeeded at both. Um, yeah, so our approach to DevOps, you know, has matured over the years. And we've, we've definitely learned a lot of hard lessons and, and lessons that we just found worked better. Um, you know, and so we, we've taken a couple different, we kind of approached it from several different angles because we found that worked the best, almost like a layered approach. You know, the first thing we did, of course, was our ISOs, which are your frontline sort of eyes and ears of your CISOs. Mm -hmm. um, problem we found initially with our ISOs is that, you know, if you follow the, the sort of standard template language that all ISOs are hired under, you know, that, that I think the job description for that was, you know, circa 1950s. Um, you know, they're, they're, they chase paper um, and they're check, and they, they check boxes, and that's about the sum total of it. You know, they wouldn't know code you know, if the reset button bit them. So that clearly had to change. So we quickly started developing specialized ISOs. We wanted ISOs that had backgrounds in coding, backgrounds in cloud. They actually had to have certificates and, and accreditations in these, in these areas. They really had to know their stuff. They had to actually be smarter than the development teams. That was step one. And we embedded them inside the development teams themselves. In other words, these were not external resources. These were literally part of the overall development process. That was step one. The st second thing we did is we empowered the development teams. Um, one of the things we've learned is that, you know, so the vast majority and for the most part, and I, you know, and I, I, there are obviously always those exceptions, but for the most part, you know, they, developers want to deploy good code. It, it, there's, th there's a pride aspect to it. They want to do the right things and secure it as well. Um, they may not always like the, the, the paper wickets that they need to jump, but they, they do want to do the right thing for the right reasons. So we empowered them. 
we gave them the ability to do the scans themselves. We gave them the ability to, to mitigate those. We gave them the ability to, to sort of initiate a lot of these things on their own. Um, you know, we refer to it as full stack development, um, but it, it really is just an approach that, that took a lot of that. And, in, and by doing that, by the way, we also empowered them to deploy once they, once they determined everything was green. In other words, they didn't need my permission. They didn't need the CIO's permission. If the, if the development team said, yep, we're good to go here, they deployed. So our, we have applications to deploy three, four times a day, um, and that's normal for us. Um, and we do that across our enterprise. Uh, and of course, we at the same time, we had to modernize our overall approach to cybersecurity at the same time, which really meant that we needed to stop focusing on things that we knew about, sort of our known risks, which is your NIST controls and, and sort of those sorts of things, um, and automate those out of our way, and then really begin focusing back in on the things we don't know about. And you know all the fun, the fun you know solar winds and log for J instances in the planet, um, because that's where the gotchas were going to come from. That's where we were going to get hurt. So we and and again these these came and then of course focusing in on sort of the big cloud security pictures. We were moving because at the time we were we were doing things in cloud that that nobody in the federal space was doing, and there was no guidance on it. And there was no real nothing around it. So we were sort of creating it as we went, um, and and learning a lot of really important lessons. But you know, at the end of the day, being able to capture all that and then utilizing and capitalizing and, and really taking that agile mindset that you know failure is is not a not a bad thing. Failure is how you just fall forward and and fail and fail fast, fall forward. And and so that you know, as as we failed, we learned, we moved forward. Um, and, and it was a really important concept that we we learned very early on and kind of applied to the overall security approach. Great, thank you for that. Uh, let's go with the, you, uh, Matthew. Yeah, I just uh, can't help but echo exactly what Shane and Hannah uh, was saying is that our security people need to be able to know what software development is like. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, whenever I was uh, doing my introduction, yeah, I'm, I'm in a hoodie because, uh, quite frankly, I have been a software developer for 19 years. Uh, I am on the reserve side, an Air Force programmer. Uh, that is my AFSC, and that's where I came up. So, Tom, whenever you mention uh, that, you know, you do your development and then you shift it over to the security folks, um, that was exactly my experience. We would get reports with 4,000 findings. The security people didn't understand what it meant, you know, that you could put whatever gibberish you want. You just had to respond to it, right? And uh, from a engineering perspective, we didn't understand what the controls were. We didn't understand what was coming back to us. Right. So whenever I think DevSecOps, uh, I frequently put it in terms of exposure therapy. Right. So now you have the developers that are getting exposed to those four to five reports or to those uh, different security scanners at the very beginning of the application development. Or, you know, if you're migrating from a legacy system early on. Right. So we do our security onboarding right after you identify what your tech stack is going to be. From that moment, you start seeing security scans coming through. So now it's not waiting to the end after development is done. Uh, rather, you're, you're seeing what the code you committed just created for security vulnerabilities, right? So now you're able to iterate closer and actually provide uh, meaningful mitigations and justifications on those findings instead of you know, trying to pull back to something you've done six months ago and say, oh, actually, that's not a big deal because I did something, I'm sure, um, and it's uh, been mitigated. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's really key is uh, getting leadership that understands what's coming through the security people understanding developers, but then also the developers understanding what the security controls are. And that way they can actually provide meaningful mitigations. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's just huge. Great. Uh, Chris? Yeah, a lot of good, good things. The only thing I really add here is that, um, you know, kind of that traditional model of handing things off to the security team to secure in production. And there's a lot of assumptions there that just don't work anymore. That assumes some level of centralized infrastructure. It assumes some sort of static release cycle. And it assumes you're gonna have a well-defined perimeter. And let's just face it, you know, applications are very decentralized uh, these days. And, um, and the way, you know, the rapid uh, development cycle in which we build applications is just not conducive to that. And I think a lot of the security teams still have this mindset of, oh, we're going to have this well-defined perimeter and, the, and they tool around that. And that, that, and that actually creates incentives for things like shadow IT, where the, the individual development teams go off and do their own thing, which can cause chaos, right? So I think in many ways, DevSecOps is arising as a way to try to meet some of those challenges. And I do think some of the security vendors have some culpability here. 
some of the biggest challenges we hear from our customers is that outside of certain types of code scanning tools, a lot of the, the software or security tools out there assume you're going to be running it in a, a production environment, right? And so, you know, some of the things that we're really focused on is how can we take some of our security tooling and shift it left so it can be it can be supported as part of the, the dev and the test cycle of the development cycle, right? You know, so that way it's, you know, you're, you're, you're testing it very early on, you know, that you can, you know, when there's rapid signature, uh, rapid security policy updates and things like that, you can make it part of that rapid software development life cycle. I think as more security vendors, you know, shift their, to, uh, their products to, to support kind of that shifting left part of the software development life cycle, it'll be a lot easier for this DevSecOps uh, mindset to, to, to permutate across organizations. Yeah, I think in fairness, that's where the industry is going. You know, I mean, they, you, you're doing waterfall, they're preparing for waterfall. Now we have, we're in a different environment. So I think that that that's that, that a general trend. We're starting to get some questions and I better start answering them or they're gonna to be too many. Uh, of course, on January 24th, I think as many of you know, the DOD CIO posted software development and open source software. I wish I had a chance to read it yet. Um, somebody has a question and, and, and whoever wants to answer it, or if we don't know the answer yet, I think we might have a webinar at 10 on the subject. But I believe it's, uh, the question is, I believe it's saying that the OSS needs to be supported versions when it goes into ops production. Am I reading that correctly? I'm not quite sure what they mean. Does anybody have an answer to that one? I think I think what we're going to end up doing here at ATARC is we're going to have we're going to be looking at this and and uh, I don't know if everybody's had a chance to unpack it in in minute detail. So maybe we'll hold that question. Uh, I'm not going to mention your name, but we'll we'll hold it. Do we have? Oh, we have uh, Matthew. Do you want to answer it? Well, I, I can at least uh, maybe talk yeah. to a piece of it. Right with open source software. Uh, a lot of times what you're looking at is uh, some tooling that's great for the community, but it doesn't have a vendor necessarily supporting it. Uh, so I think that's one of the challenges. And I think that may be where that question is kind of geared towards. Um, and I, quite frankly, I don't think that there would be uh, a strong answer to have supported software. Uh, so we have to see what we can do uh, to make sure that the open source software that's coming through is going to be secure uh, and be able to meet the needs. And uh, within a DevSecOps world, uh, there is continuous integration uh, practices that we can put into place um, that, you know, we can scan the software, look for uh, various types of vulnerabilities if it's open source, then we have access to the source code. Uh, so we can go in and do an analysis, look at the source code, and then know what kind of risk that we're bringing in. Uh, and then also, you know, your regression testing, that's a practice that we've been doing for decades. Uh, and, you know, most regression testing can be automated. Uh, so we, if we're going to use open source software as a pivotal part of a particular application, uh, then let's wrap it up with some regression testing. So that way we know uh, the updated version of that software is going to be functioning the way that we intended to function. Great, great. Um, Hannah, I've got a question for you. You mentioned the Fortify scan, which is application vulnerability. Uh, the question is more around the database vulnerability. How do you run? Do you do you guys look at that in particular? Or? Uh, sure. So um, I think it all depends on like your coding practices. So I, uh, you know, your database security is like really important. Um, but if you're kind of maintaining your own database. It all depends if you're like pulling APIs from like existing systems of record, which we do uh, to a certain extent. But the way that it's all packaged is like a, the best way to maintain security. So how you're containerizing your applications, how you're like separating the database from the app actual application, those are all kind of factors into like maintaining a secure database. Um, I, I would also say that um, when I talk about Fortify, I, I use it like jokingly because a lot of organizations use that scan and only that scan and send my like application secure. And that is just terrible fortify or terrible security scanning practices. Uh, I po posted on LinkedIn the other day about how DISA requires ACAS scans in order to uh, be whitelisted onto the system and only ACAS scans, um, even though ACAS scans aren't um, effective when managing security of containerized applications. And so uh, I, I said that like tongue in cheek is you really do yeah. need a robust set of static and dynamic scanning, container vulnerability scanning to really have a solid security posture versus right. just kind of a one-off scan. So that's kind of what I was poking at. Okay, gotcha. And um, I'm gonna ask one, we got a couple directed questions, but Shane, I'm gonna get you involved. Um, 
developers having the power with the pet developers having the power to deploy is repudiation a concern does this solution provide performance insights for developers um well who, who, who developed it i guess right you know yeah. who developed repudiation is always, is always a concern i don't know yeah there's never a time that that isn't however you know one of the things if you ever ask me what's the most important thing you need to get right up front is your identity um, you know, if, if you don't understand, you know, who's on your network and what assets have the right to be on your network and what they have the right to do, you sort of not just lost the battle, you've lost the war. So, you know, getting identity security right is critical. So USCIS, we focused heavily on it. I was one of the few CISOs in the early years who actually owned our ICAM program and they reported to me, which meant that if you wanted an ATO for your system, you were going to be single sign-on compliant and you were going to have role-based access enabled by our systems. So we control that at a very finite level. Um, and that, that goes all the way into our development, including our pipeline. So we have good controls on that. There is performance monitoring, but we, we, they, all the development teams can and do use different types of development monitors. Oddly enough, um, our, our logging solution is, is probably the biggest use case we have. Um, most organizations, you know, their developers don't have direct access to their log applications, whereas probably well over 1500 developers have access to my logs um, because they utilize them in a performance manner. It's actually pretty advanced, pretty, pretty interesting way to do it. So, yes, we always are worried about that, but we we uh, we have other mitigations in place. And not to mention, it's not like we, you know, there is always that trust but verify. So red teaming and blue teaming are critical pieces of your security program. Great, great. Well, um, I'm not scared of too many things, but I am scared of the people that do our accreditation for our credits, and we have to like make sure we do the polls. They're, I'm definitely scared of them. Uh, we've got a few. We got a. I, I, I would call the first one a warm up question, but we're gonna give it a shot anyway. Um, you know how important is security for your organization's uh, modern applications? Uh, important, not any more important than traditional applications, more important, more important are traditional applications of utmost importance, more important than our, our traditional applications. I guess it isn't a, and we can't vote. This is the worst thing, the worst improvement they made on Zoom. We're not allowed to vote. So uh, you all are going to have to carry the weight on this one. Uh, Kim, do we have some results? Okay. Interesting. Okay, end up being a little more interesting than I thought. Uh, any comments from our panel? Surprised? Not surprised? I'm kind of surprised. Um, I'll say I, I, I mean, it's all in risk. When I think of modern versus traditional applications, I think of are you on prem? Are you in the cloud? Like, what does that look like? So there's always a different risk profile for for that, but. Security is security, and it didn't shouldn't matter if it's a new or old application. Uh, frankly, I think you actually should be more concerned if it's an older application that it's being patched and updated. Um, yeah. So yeah, that it's a surprising result. Chris, how about I you? Add, I love your take. Yeah. I, I was just going to add to that. Yeah, I think I would say it's equally important, right? I mean, in many ways, you know, you could say with traditional applications, you have a very well defined attack perimeter. But also, if somebody gets in, they have access to their entire application. Whereas with a modern application being decentralized, you have pieces of that. So you have you have a larger attack, you have a, a larger attack surface, but you have many different individual perimeters, right? And so you can you can can't say it's one or the other. They're both equally important. Great. Anybody else want to chip in, or we move on to the next question? Yeah, I'll throw in a little bit more, and yeah. I think it'll go uh, back to kind of what Shane was talking about uh, a little bit ago. Um, in my opinion, the modern software, it's more important. Uh, and quite frankly, it's because we want to put power in the hands of our product teams. We want to empower them to be able to go into production. Uh, so therefore, we're, we need to put in guardrails. We need to identify how they can get into production. Uh, and you know what Chris was saying, how can they get there without risking the other neighboring applications that are deployed alongside? Uh, so you know, how do we isolate? How do we you know, create that sandbox where if somebody were to own a particular container uh, that they're not going to be able to escape from it and go somewhere else. Great, great. Uh, our next question, I think is pretty timely. I speaking, this was the week for memos to drop, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you caught that the White House, uh, you know, had an executive order on zero trust, which is one of the biggest topics we have going in here at ATAR, considering we have 53 companies in an ATAR lab and you know, going to 12 use cases, but I, I kind of want to bring it back with this poll question was actually, can we put it up? It, it actually 
kind of ties in uh, DevSecOps to it. Um, you know, how important is zero trust security for your organization's modern applications? Uh, we are planning on implementing zero trust at the onset of deploying modern apps. So maybe after this, we can talk a little bit about zero trust and, and the strategy. Okay. All right, I don't want to taint this scientific poll. I was going to say, if you're, if you're, it's not important to modern apps. Uh oh. So, I don't, I don't think this is too surprising. Uh, how are, how are you all aligning? How, how can we align to zero trust principles? You know, I maybe start off with you, Hannah. How, how is that? How's that going? I mean, you're doing your normal job, and now we have zero trust. How does that? integrate with DevSecOps? Yeah, I mean, so this is gonna be a little spicy. So uh, we have a spiceometer at the software factory, one to five peppers, um, if something's spicy. Uh, so it's a little spicy, but I think zero trust is is a very nebulous concept, just like SBOM, very nebulous concept yeah. that um, has now become like a buzzword um, in, in security uh, and in yeah, bill of materials mindset. So. I think zero trust is just least privilege access uh, for, for all intents yeah. and purposes. And, mm -hmm. and how do you Im implement a solid role-based access uh, control process? And so we, that's something that's baked into the way that we develop currently. Um, we do wanna empower product teams and application teams to have as much access to the system that they need, but it doesn't mean they need access to the AWS admin console to do their job, as an example. You know, like that's for the platform teams um, to be able to, to manage. Um, do they need access to cube uh, config files? I don't know, like it depends on like what the use case is. And so it's a case by case basis is understanding what the use case of that particular product team needs in order to deliver, but they should have access to like their logs, their monitoring, all, the, all those dashboards and features and uptime that they need in order to like maintain the, the reliability of their application is super critical, but it's really just baking that into like your overall you know, system security plan or your body of evidence when it comes to your EMS packages. It's not something that needs to be shocking. It, it can really just be something that is is how you do business versus something that's mandated over top. Right, right. No, it's interesting. Um, Ian? Uh, yes, you know, uh, the, the way I like to, you know, explain zero trust, you know, among all of the, the other buzzwords that everybody, you know, wants to come up and say, hey, well, what does this mean? What, what do we have to do to do this or implement this? Um, you know, I, I related to, you know, um, kind of uh, like the building that you would be working in. Um, you know, if you get access or have access to the building, it doesn't necessarily mean you have access to all the strong rooms and skiffs as well. You know, you, you have to have that privilege access to go into certain rooms. You know, you have to have certain clearances to be in certain rooms. Um, but now when you look at it for zero trust on, you know, a network, uh, you, you have, um, you know, not only people trying to access things, but now you have servers, you have containers that need to, uh, you know, access different pieces. So if you kind of think about, um, you know, zero trust in the sense of, um, you know, when you say user, that's not just a person accessing, that's something trying to access something else, um, you know, and, and just like Hannah said, uh, you know, what does it need to do if it does need, it need access to this resource? Does it just need to read a file or read whatever? Or does it need uh, the more elevated admin privileges? Uh, so, you know, it, it's not the, uh, you know, a simple lift of, uh, you know, let's just implement this and, you know, everybody gets a, a key and, you know, it will authenticate. Uh, you, you really have to look at, you know, what are the, you know, down to the permissions that the, these things need. Um, so that way, if something does happen to be compromised, um, you know, you're, you're not giving away the, the whole network or the whole building, uh, at, you know, to stick with what I was saying. Great. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, and I think that Hannah was 100% right that there are a lot of new buzzwords that have come out for a lot of processes and procedures that we've been doing for years. Um, now, I do think when it comes to zero trust that it has uh, shown a light on a particular area that we have made improvements. Uh, so, you know, with platform one, we created the cloud native access point, which has uh, built in zero trust capabilities. Uh, and really what the difference in what that access point looks like is one, we're, you know, bringing in Comply to Connect. 
not new, right? Uh, we're bringing in RBAC, not new. Uh, but whenever we are putting the two together and we're making sure that the endpoint that's connecting, the NPE, uh, the server, whatever, uh, we're making sure that it meets a minimum security standard. We're making sure that the user is meeting a minimum security standard. And then uh, some of the tooling that we have, some of the products that have been emerging as these buzzwords come out, um, has enabled us to take a look at how we gain access to networks. And instead of going a traditional VPN route and having access to an entire enclave, uh, we're trying to do micro segmentation, right? We're trying to get a bunch of small VPNs that can run side by side. So that way they can go to individual services instead of an entire enclave. And Ian, this is exactly what you were just saying, right? Uh, we want to limit the risk and we want to focus it in on uh, in individual items. So that way, if it gets owned, that VPN micro segmented tunnel gets owned, they're not going to spill over into another service. Right. Great. Great. And um, Chris, uh, I know you guys are part of our like uh, zero trust lab, and it seems like I should just rename security zero trust. It, it's, it, it, but uh, love your perspectives as a product manager. Well, it is the buzzword du jour these days. Now, I'll show my age a little bit. I, I can remember 15 years ago talking about the deparameterization of the network, which was a very wordy way to basically say zero trust, right? So it's a concept we've been talking about for a long time. Um, but I, it's, it's a, I think it's an issue of scale, right? Um, I think everybody knows what Moore's law is. Not a lot of people may be familiar with Metcalf's law, but Metcalf's law kind of postulated that the value of a network relates to the number of connected users on it. And so if you put that kind of in a concept that today's networks, we have smart devices interacting, we have API calls for the, you know, the services of our applications interacting, we have people interacting, we have, you know, our infrastructure is spread out to the four corners of the globe. You know, that, that's a scale issue that compounds the issue of zero trust. But I totally agree with what Hannah says. It's, it's really an RBAC issue, right? Making sure you have well-defined roles and permissions, not just for people, but for devices and, and services across your network. Great. And Shane, I'm going to give you the last word. You probably didn't think I was going to get to you, but I, I, I didn't forget. I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to disagree a bit with my, my fellow panelists. You know, we, we, we accidentally stumbled into zero trust just because we were so heavy in cloud. And, and what we began to recognize and realize at, at some point was that the perimeter of our enterprise was something we were just sort of pretending was there. Um, it, it, you know, when we were in the cloud and we started pushing in envelopes, start doing different things with that and, and different technologies and, and applications, we, we just realized that, you know what, that, that perimeter is not there anymore. Our approach to how we secure our enterprise needed to change. And that's, that's when we fell into the zero trust sort of model. First of all, I really, really do despise the zero trust term. Um, it, it implies something that it's not. You know, what we're really talking about is asset trust. You're, you're talking about something at a very finite level. Um, and it goes beyond role base. It's actually getting all the way to the attributes. Um, and and in, any individual ass, assets can have a number of different attributes. Those attributes are going to have various you know, applications that are the various flavors of, of impacts that can have, that can change them depending on the circumstances they fall into. And on top of that, you have to start defining your enterprise according to trust and how that trust is applied. How does trust degrade over time? How does behavior affect trust? How does asset to asset interaction affect trust? You know, these the and the level and the details that you have to understand that your enterprise at is, is mind boggling. Um, and, and so really it, it's taking your, it's really placing your, your entire your entire enterprise at a, at a microscopic level. Um, and, and of course, all of this with the end state goal to take an application that's currently internally facing only and dump it on the public internet and, and still secure it at the same level as, as if it was internally still only. So, I mean, if, if you kind of place that all into perspective, you realize that the, if you if done correctly, a zero trust architecture, one is not a project, it's a journey. And it's a good journey that all of us are going to be on for a long, long time. In fact, I would fully expect there to be zero trust program offices set, set up just to deal with it. Um, because every single time a new technology or a new application or anything comes out, you have to reassess your zero trust inter architecture. It's just the nature of the game. And, and, and so then you, of course, have to apply all your threat modeling on top of that. So it, it, is, a, it is an undertaking that nobody should be, at the faint of heart, should look at and go, oh, yeah, we can do this. You know, we're, we're pretty mature and pretty further down the lines in a lot of different areas. And, and I'm looking at it, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing this is, this is an, it's going to be fun, in my view. I think this is a lot of fun, but it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, yes. So I know in our zero trust lab, um, you know, the government came up with a whole bunch of use cases, but 
it, it's not not like one company can do everything. So you got to so, stitch this together. It's kind of like a, a tools chain. That's like so a there's tool not, chain. There's not a, there's not something. It's not a one and done. You're not going to buy a tool and go, oh, we're good. We're zero trusty. It's just that's just not the way it's going to work. And, and in fact, you know, every single organization, you know, the, who's listening to me or is on or is part of this panel, I guarantee you their their deployment of their zero trust architecture is going to be very different because Great. it should be. Yep. Good, good stuff. Um, let's go to the last couple of poll questions here real quick. If we can pull those up. And uh, where is your organization on the modern apps journey? And for those of you in industry, it's like you, you, you typically you're working with a government associations. I mean, a government entity. So let, just kind of kind of interested to see what, what, what would come back on this. See how many are more toward the end than the beginning. I think we've got a good range here. Okay. I'll tell you what, we made some progress over, I would say, Ian, especially from you, I've been on a couple of these with you. I think this has changed over time. What do you think? It's getting a little better? Uh, yes, uh, I, I definitely believe it. it, it is getting a, a lot better now that... Um, you know, uh, you know, from what I've seen, is especially with, um, you know, kind of my progression through, you know, the DevSecOps, DevOps journey um, is, you know, just get really wrapping your head around, just like we were doing with Zero Trust, really wrapping your head around, you know, what does that mean, not just in the, the general sense, but what does that mean for my organization or what does that mean for my project or, you know, what, what I'm working on? So, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, it's not just the, the individual's journey. It, it is truly the organization's journey a, as we come through this. And, you know, from my perspective and what really helped me, and I know Shane and uh, Matt, Chris and Hannah kind of all hit on it before is, you know, you, you need to give your developers kind of that freedom to, you know, not just be in the development world. You got to be able to show them, hey, this is what security is doing. This is why they're handing you, you know, 400, uh, list of 400 vulnerabilities. And this is how you can, you know, uh, catch those earlier. So you don't get a list of 400 vulnerabilities. Uh, I mean, and really allowing, you know, all of your team to, uh, you know, be innovative. I, I like to at least take an hour out of the day just to go try something new, go try to do something different. Um, and, you know, see how it works out. Maybe I completely fail at it and say, okay, we'll try something different tomorrow. Um, but, you know, that having that time to really, you know, kind of play around with the concept or play around with the new tool to figure out, you know, what is it capable of, um, you know, really helps me. And I know others who, who do the same and it really helps them. And, you know, the, not just the understanding of the tool or the capability, but, you know, those concepts in general. Yeah, I, great. Thank you for that. That's good perspective. Uh, one question I have, and I, I've just kind of seen it over time. I remember, you know, there's so many players in DevSecOps and they're kind of coming and going. There's a lot of consolidation in the market and then customer demand is all different. So it's, I, it seems like people set up a, a, a DevSecOps tool chain, but then customer requirements are a little different. You know, you have a lot of different customers. How do you, how do you balance that? out and, and make decisions on what tools you're going to do. And, and uh, I'll start off with you on that one, Matthew, because you guys have been, you got all these BOAs with everybody. How do you actually make that work? You know, I, you got every single company, like you have access to them, but how do you, it's the pulling it together for a customer. It's, it seems to me that seems kind of difficult. Right. And I mean, with platform one, uh, understanding what our mission set is and how we plan to scale. Uh, I think that's, you know, key in, you know, answering this question. Uh, platform one, we don't want to be a software factory. Like we have a software factory that others can come in, they can get their feet wet, they can understand what uh, is in the realm of possible, but we don't want to be the long-term support for that particular effort for exactly the reason that you just stated. So what we've done is we've created uh, what we call Big Bang. And what Big Bang gives you is an orchestration platform. So if a mission owner comes to us and they want to set up their own environment, they want to create their own factory, then they can come in and get Big Bang, deploy it within their environment. And now they have a certain level of controls that are in place. Uh, it doesn't have any tooling to support your CI environment, but the Big Bang offering also has add-ons. And these add-ons are going to be where the customization really comes into play. Do you need a code repo? Do you need uh, a security scanner? You know, your fortifies, your covarities, your check marks, whatever it is. And you can pick and choose what you want 
and then bring that into your particular area. So instead of platform one trying to scale up to a large number of people, we want to stay lean, we want to stay flexible, so that way we don't risk going down you know, the red tape route, and we want to push uh, the, the mission owners to really own their mission. Uh, whenever it comes to us interacting with you know, the swags, they have hardware in the loop testing where they're gonna have custom uh, emulation to be able to run a lot of uh, the regression tests that they wanna run. That's not something that I'm gonna be able to put into a central environment that's supporting folks right. from across the DOD. Uh, so you know, that, that's our model is you know, we want to uh, help you get to a certain level so that way we have a level of governance, we have a level of standardization, but it also helps to get you there faster, right? You can inherit those controls. You can work that through your ATO, uh, and then you're building on what you want for your assess uh, process uh, or your continuous ATO, depending upon uh, you know what your AO wants to do and how they want to move it. Um, and then it works through that assess only package for the individual applications being built on that ecosystem. Great, that's a good explanation. Thank you for that, and uh, Hannah. Yeah, I think we're definitely in a, um, the Army DevSecOps ecosystem is definitely less mature than Platform One when it comes to like length of time. Um, so we're really looking to better understand the market within the Army and what uh, organizations are looking for when it comes to DevSecOps environment. Uh, so we actually take, uh, I'd say like a slightly, similar but slightly different approach is that we have these product offerings, these various um, pieces or design patterns that we say, hey, these are our path to production product offerings. And if you meet this particular design pattern, great, we'll onboard you, we'll get you into production, that's great. Some organizations just wanna do some CI uh, builds and to run some security scanning and build some artifacts. And we have a product offering for them as well. So it's really meeting the organization where they're at on their DevSecOps journey. Um, and we don't build software or build these products based on technology choices or tool choices, uh, rather based on what users need, what feature sets they need. A great example is one of our path to production teams did a, you know, reached out and did user interviews with a set of application teams and said, hey, what like feature sets do you need? Found out a lot of them need S3 buckets or a lot of them need RabbitMQ or a lot of them need Redis. And so implementing a set of common services and features that teams can leverage. Authentication is another great one. You know, do we offer a centralized authentication offering? Uh, right now we do, we have two, we use login.gov through GSA, but we also have EMSA, which is the Army's enterprise authentication system because auth is required for IL-4 applications. So how do we make that um, a streamlined cohesive product that teams can leverage? You know, I think over time, we wanna be able to break out our EMAS package and provide a body of evidence of which organizations can say, I actually just want this like sliver of inheritance. I don't need all that inheritance uh, or I just wanna grab these sets of features. And I think we're at that point now where we're maturing that um, over time, but right now we're just trying to provide a set of features and products that organizations can leverage. Yeah, it seems like some organizations that they're just starting, they need an easy button. They need something already. They don't, they're not at the stage where they even know what they need, probably, you know. So that's what happened with platform one, I think, you know, you guys there. Uh Ian. Yes. Um, uh, I know with the department I'm working with now, um, you know, especially with um, the entire DI2E situation of, you know, some projects and teams needing to move away, um, you know, they're, they're all looking for, you know, what, what is that new uh, platform that we can go get, you know, be hosted on or go find somewhere. Um, and, you know, one of the uh, key things for bringing, um, you know, somebody who kind of understands DevOps or DevSecOps onto the team uh, uh, was to have somebody who can help with, you know, making those connections. Uh, like I said before, a lot of the teams, you know, come in, they know what tools they want. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't want to say, well, you've been using this entire set of tools. Well, we only support this. So you have to completely move everything over. You know, we, we want it to be, you know, uh, as least of a headache as possible, at least in the beginning, because we, we know and understand that, you know, they're kind of going through a time crunch of, well, you know, my project's still supported and DI2E is going away. So what, what do we do? Um, you know, and one of the ways we kind of alleviate, um, you know, when it comes down to a, a team or project, uh, you know, who wants to maybe kind of step up their game, implement some pipelines, implement some automation. Uh, we, we have our core team members who are, you know, handling our infrastructure in the cloud, who are handling our networks, 
um, you know, handling the service get, uh, desk. And then we have uh, a group of ind individuals um, who, you know, have kind of done a little bit with DevOps or DevSecOps or kind of like uh, what we call our surge team, where if there is a customer that's experiencing issues or difficulties or just needs a little more help, uh, we can dedicate, uh, dedicate some of, uh, you know, those members of that team to come in, really work with them and help them out to, you know, work through some of those uh, issues uh, that they're hitting, um, you know, uh, because in the past, they really didn't have that concept. Uh, and, you know, uh, as your team is sitting there, you know, kind of banging their head against the wall, then it becomes, you know, well, this organization really doesn't help us. They didn't help us through our issues. And you start to get that bad rap going around. Great. Uh, Shane? So this is an interesting question because it sort of gets at the heart of why USCIS is, is shifting towards the microservices architecture and, and as a deployment strategy um, and, and with an eye towards so even, well, some we're actually working with serverless now, but really an eye towards serverless, um, you know, because it, it, it really, you know, when we've got, I don't even know how many different pipelines and running at any given point. And, and I, I have like 3000 developers running around my agency at any given point. So, you know, huge, you know, that, that drives the, the amount of diversity at the tool level is, is unreal. Like it would, it would give you a migraine to look at it. So one of the things we've started looking for and, and deployed our microservices solution for is, is sort of getting rid of a lot of that, like reducing the sort of the overall noise. And from my perspective, you know, the reason I, I see DevSecOps is a little bit, it has to change to meet that is really in the microservices world, you, you got to do security first. Um, so it really becomes like a security and then DevOps um, because you've got to build in all your base layers long before anyone, you know, puts a single, you know, piece of code down. Um, and, and once you do that though, and when done right, that it begins to inherit up into your environment. Those become the base layer of all things that things are built on. Your pipelines are built on that and tie, your, your, your production environments are deployed. Everything's deployed into those production environments. So really, it, you know, this, this gets at the heart of why we're going that direction. But it also, you know, creates a number of new, new, new problems for us to deal with. Um, and, and really, you're now you're, because microservices are, are of the nature, you're, you're con they're constantly being deployed and updated. It's not like a systems release because microservices are just small little pieces of a system. Um, so, you know, your, your, your ability to monitor that and control that um, are, are really, you know, in terms of scale of sky scope is, is out, of, out of this world. You've got to get a good handle on your API security to deal with that, because really, at the end of the day, this is really going to become an API problem. Um, as well as making sure your, your secrets management solutions are up to, are up to par to handle that, as well as your certificate management solutions. So, you know, getting all these core pieces in place, um, it really helps alleviate some of the, at least the, the tooling questions. Um, but that really means that you've got to plan and get your security solutions or your security platform correct and upright and, and done right at the very beginning. After that, it becomes threat hunting and, and sort of risk management. Great. Well, uh... I'm glad we got a chance to touch on microservices. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to kind of wrap up with you on some of your, um, some comments, but can, is there anything else uh, from the panel that you want to bring up that is your challenge of 2022 that we haven't talked about? Hannah, it looks like you want to say something. So I'm going to call on you. Yeah. Radi radical prioritization is always a challenge. I will say there are many things fun and interesting things to do in the DevSecOps yeah. space. And you have to make sure your teams are not overwhelmed and can prioritize the workloads that will meet their feet, the, the users that they intend to meet. So that is think, going to always be my challenge. That's my challenge at ATARC. So I, I feel your pain on that one. What's our priorities for this year? Um, Matthew? No, I, I think that prioritization is huge. Uh, I think that there's also still gaps uh, that we're, we're looking to fill. Um, you know, we've developed a lot of CI environments that uh, are far superior to what our legacy processes were, uh, but I think that there's, there's still more to come. Uh, and I would love to see, you know, more chaos engineering uh, and see what we can do to automate a lot of that, um, more performance testing that we can embed in a lot of our different pipelines uh, and just really help to close the gap on uh, some of uh, the other feature sets that are just, quite frankly, great uh, practices when it comes to software development. Great. Ian? 
Yeah, so I think the uh, the big challenge for NSWC Dahlgren uh, when it comes to in terms of software factories and you know services we provide is really going to be you know what what is the idea you know identity or what we want to put out there uh, for you know what we offer to to the Navy or DoD. Um, you know, I can already see the, the kind of head to head going on of well our software factory does this and we're number one and you know. Uh, our, the other software factor says, well, no, the CNO said we're number one. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be really kind of, uh, you know, taking a hard look and saying, well, I, you know, I don't think there's going to be a single software factory. It's going to be multiple and we're going to, you know, excel in certain areas. And, you know, some may start in one software factory and then, you know, the project may move to another one in, in the future. So I think it's going to be really working through uh, and coming together as uh, the Navy as a whole. Uh, maybe even DOD as a whole to figure out, you know, what, what are those centers of excellence, uh, you know, going to look like in the future. Great. Thank you, Ian. And Chris, you, no pressure or anything. It's been a great panel. You get the last word. <laughs> well, I'll make it quick because I know we're at time, but uh, some of the, some of the, you know, we had the question before is like, you know, what's the tooling going to look like? And as, as somebody who's investing time in making tools for dev SecOps and DevOps, I would love to see standardization. But the fact is, one of the, one of the words I heard in this session that really stuck out to me is we're on a journey and we're early in that journey. So there's going to still be, you know, our customers are going to be nimble. Vendors are going to have to be nimble. There's going to be a lot of uh, moving around. I think one of the words I heard a lot from a few different panelists is guardrails. And I think that's the key, right? As long as you're investing in tooling that allows you to insert um, guardrails effectively for your development teams and DevOps teams so you're not interrupting them, uh, but yet you can still have the right level of security guidance as part of what the applications are developing. That's really the key thing. So it's really a combination of tooling and processes. Yep, yep. I think Shane was talking about that a little bit. Yeah, and, and everybody else. Well, thank you, uh, Hannah, Ian, Shane, Chris, Matthew. This has been great. Um, I can't believe January is almost over. It's like, man, this year is flying by quickly and, and I'm sure we'll get you back. Um, so thank you to all the audience. Uh, a lot of great questions. If my team can capture those questions and parse them out. Oh, have you completed all the polls and would you like to receive CP credit? This is critical. You can uh, do that. We will give you that kind of, you know, CX service that we're supposed to based on an executive order on CX. We're, we're trying to up our, a service game. But anyway, thank you all for the panelists. Uh, and this is our event next week. Uh, more on identity security. It's like good for this crowd, actually. But anyway, have a good rest of your day and have a good weekend. Thank you all.